Well, the provincial election is over, and uh, I'm back on uh, Saga 960 AM every night, uh, Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock. And I thought, uh, given that uh, we've all sort of, actually not all, because 57% of us stayed home, uh, we've all uh, been a little bit of exhausted with the provincial election, um, we should turn uh, to uh, what's going on uh, with the federal conservative leadership and uh, to check in with uh, someone uh, that I think uh, really is tuned into what's going on with uh, that the leadership uh, process. And that's Sarah McIntyre, who is the founder of VUCA Sarah. It's a consulting company uh, that uh, provides uh, government affairs and, uh, and government relations uh, consulting services to people. Uh, I guess you do some uh, public affairs and, uh, and uh, uh, GR work uh, uh, for different companies. Uh, Sarah has got an unbelievable background. She was the director of communications uh, for uh, um, Christy uh, Clark, when uh, Christy was the Premier of British Columbia, and she worked in communications for the former Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper. She's been involved in the Conservative Party. Uh, gosh, sounds like you're probably your whole life, given all the different experiences uh, that you've had. Uh, she's traveled the world. She's met the Queen. She's uh, uh, really had some incredibly interesting experiences. Uh, and she's been following the Conservative leadership uh, uh, campaigns in a great amount of detail. So, Sarah, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for uh, having me, Brian. That's quite the quite the introduction. I'm tired already. <laughs> well, you've got quite the experience, and uh, you know, whenever I see uh, my favorite president, President Bartlett, and uh, and uh, mm -hmm. C.J. Craig, I think of you because you were uh, sort of that uh, influential person within Harper's office that I think you really uh, had a big impact on uh, on what he said and how he said it, and uh, and how he communicated with uh, the country and. Um, and I think you probably added to that uh, from a positivity standpoint dramatically. Anyway, tell us where you think we are. Um, I understand Friday uh, membership sales closed uh, and uh, on the, in the conservative uh, membership process uh, for the leadership uh, uh, campaign. Um, and now we've turned from the selling memberships to the persuasion stage. Um, uh, we've got uh, uh, a couple of front runners and a couple of uh, people in the back of the pack, but uh, in the last couple of elections uh, for the conservative leadership, it hasn't necessarily been the front runner that has won. Um, people have had to make friends uh, with people uh, down the ballot uh, because uh, you've got to get over 50.1% of the, you got to get over 50%, you got to get 50.1% of the votes to actually win. So give us sort of the, the roadmap uh, to what you think is going to happen if you could. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot's happened already. Um, so we've got good six good candidates representing basically almost every um, every part of the tent uh, running. Uh, we've had our, the English and, and French uh, language debates. Um, and the numbers coming in from the membership sales are quite staggering, actually. There's some suggestion that there's been 400,000 new or renewed memberships uh, that have been added to the party since this race began, which is, I think will make it uh, the largest political party um, ever in, in Canada. Um, so from a party standpoint, it's, it's, it's pretty healthy. It's been a good process in terms of getting people engaged and getting them signed up for the memberships. But you're right, we're now running into the persuasion phase. Um, so who's got who's got uh, the best policies, the best of public appeal, uh, not just for the base, but also um, in a general election. So you're gonna see obviously, and, and we've seen this in the debates already, the two kind of competing visions for the party, you know, Pierre Polliver, which is basically a lot more populist um, and um, kind of really, uh, you know, aligning them himself with the traditional base of the party. That's, you know, the Canadian Alliance base of the party. And then you've got the Jean Charest and Patrick Browns uh, to, um, you know, the, the, the progressive side of the conservative party. Um, so, you know, what are, how are they going to um, compete for uh, these, these votes and differentiate themselves? And, and is there a candidate on the ballot that can actually bridge both both of those camps. Um, you know, right now it doesn't it doesn't seem that there's one that's well known and um, you know a front runner front runner that that is actually able to kind of have one foot in both the traditional Canadian Alliance base and the traditional pro, um, progressive conservative base. So um, you know, the, for party watchers and observers and people that have been around since the beginning of the party, like my myself. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty critical time and uh, we don't want to have too much fighting within the family. But, um, you know, we've gone through this uh, a few times in the past couple of years and come up short. 
when it comes to the general election and um, the the Canadian general population. So, um, you know, the the organizing committee did a did a long uh, leadership uh, uh, race. You know, the votes not until September. So I think hopefully they, they've got the structure right this time and, and uh, there'll be a clear and decisive winner as opposed to what's happened in the past with the ballots and the ranking system. So they, they've still got this ranking system where every riding gets a hundred votes or something like this. And so therefore, um, you know, yeah. it really doesn't matter how many uh, memberships you uh, sell in, in Brampton or Peel, um, you really got to spread those votes out across the whole country. And, and, and is that a good system? to make every riding well, equal, particularly when there's a whole bunch of ridings that, you know, in urban, uh, you know, Canada and or, uh, or Quebec that the conservatives have got, you know, little chance of winning. And so therefore one would have thought that, that if you actually had one person, one vote democracy, it would have been rural areas in Alberta that should have had more influence. Well, the voting system for a leader is really uh, what was brokered between Peter McKay and Stephen Harper. Um, it's what gave birth to this party. Um, and it was a compromise that was reached so that, um, you know, the high membership sales in, in the in the West wouldn't drown out the voices of those uh, in the East. And that's the, the very reason why there's a there's a point system. So each riding gets 100 points and you have to have at least 100 memberships in order to to get those points exercised and added to to your list so um you know i think the the um, nature of the voting system is um it ensures that every leadership candidate has to pay attention to every region of the country whether or not we have a viable chance to win the riding in the general election. We still want to be able to go out and, and talk to those people as members of the party and make sure that their, their values and, and priorities are, are reflected or at least addressed uh, by the party. So I think it really, although it, it's, you know, a lot of people say it's confusing and it's not fair because, you know, you can add up Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, it's still not going to be the same as Quebec. Um, but I think what it does is that it ensures that, um, you know, there's, uh, um, there's equal attention given to equal parts of the country. And so, you know, the, the idea that, uh, that a leader of a national party is truly reflective in that process. We're talking about the conservative, uh, national conservative uh, leadership campaign that's going on right now. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes with Sarah McIntyre, the uh, founder of VUCA Sarah Consulting. In uh, two minutes, we're going to be back with her. And I'm going to ask her about whether there really is two very different visions of Canada, two different parties within this, uh, this current party. Stay with us, everybody. That's good. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've been off for the last three weeks because I was uh, involved in uh, the provincial uh, election campaign and I wasn't allowed to be on uh, on air. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be back talking to all of you. Uh, and uh, I wanted to turn from provincial politics to national politics and invited Sarah McIntyre, who is a long-term uh, conservative activist, communications expert, party member, etc., to talk a little bit of what's going on in the uh, in the National uh, Conservative Leadership Campaign. Sarah, uh, I wonder if you could uh, help me here. You know, from an outsider standpoint, and you mentioned how this has sort of been the merger of two different parties to create what is the current Conservative Party. It almost seems to me like you've got one front runner running to be the leader of the Reform Alliance Party and another person running to be the leader of the former Progressive Conservative Party. And neither of them is appealing to the balance of the uh, other half of this now newly merged uh, or recently merged uh, Conservative Party. Um, their visions of Canada are so different. Um, their, their policies are, are pretty different. Um, is it two parties or is it one party? Is it two visions of Canada or one vision of Canada? Can uh, Jean Charest ever appeal to the, to the Reform Alliance people or can, can uh, Pierre Polyev ever appeal to the old progressive conservative party members? Um, good question. And I, you know, that's what we're going through this process for. So my internet connection isn't the greatest right now. So I hope I don't, uh, I don't lose the, the connection, but it's funny you talk about two parties, you know, I, I'm just looking here, I'm going through some of my uh, files because I'm, I'm actually moving and I have here my, my old Canadian Alliance membership card. 
from 2004. <laughs> um, but look, a conservative, you know, you go back to get back to basics in, and everybody can, can agree on, on the basics, you know, less government, less waste, smaller government, um, you know, less burden uh, regulatory for, for businesses, uh, a priority on the economy, priority on trade. Uh, these are all, you know, uh, very much con uh, conservative values, um, pride in the country, all, all of those things are kind of, are immovable principles of a conservative party, whether it calls itself the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, or it calls itself the Conservative Party of, of Canada. Um, and so, you know, I think there are probably more things <clears throat> that um, Pierre Polliver and, and Jean Charest and Patrick Brown and Leslie Lewis and, and Scott Atchison and Roman Baber actually agree upon than disagree upon. It's just that where they do disagree, it's very fundamental and they are very far away from each other. You know, whether you think about, you know, Jean Charest and, and you know, when he was premier hiking taxes or being supportive of the carbon tax like Patrick Brown as well, or, um, you know, uh, Pierre um, really mantling this, you know, freedom um, uh, mantra uh, that's really tapped into, I think, uh, some uh, areas of the population that felt really disenfranchised over the past two years weren't reflected at all in any of the leaders, um, of whether that's municipal, provincial, or federal. Um, and, and he is riding that, and it's been effective for him. I think it's a bit of a elastic band type of support where it's going to get so far where uh, his that level of support is going to for those types of efforts are, is going to be um, self limiting. Um, I will tell you, I did go to his, um, he had a rally here. I live in um, Michael Chong's writing, a former leadership candidate that chose not to throw his hat in this time, but uh, it's a pretty conservative area. It's lots of farming, agricultural, and uh, pretty conservative, both on the provincial and federal ridings. And I went to, it was a lunchtime rally for Pierre um, in Fergus. It had basically, I think, three days notice, and it was at a rainy lunchtime and, uh, at the Civic Center. And, and I'd say there's probably was about three to 400 people that showed up. <laughs> like I, and then, you know, like if that is a barometer of who, who he's speaking to, and, and not all of them were, were conservative members. They were people that hadn't been involved in politics. So Whatever his vision is, it, it is larger than just what you know the, the truck convoy and and end mandates. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, it's it's not just memberships that you sell. You got to get the got to get the boat out. So, uh, but can, can I sell membership? Because it's got to translate into action too. Can I challenge you on that for a second, if I could? Um, so. You know, I was part of an all candidates uh, debate um, and uh, there was the the new blue and the Ontario party uh, candidates uh, on uh, the, the dais as well as the liberal and the uh, the green and the, and the conservative progressive conservative. The, if, if you if you used the crowd as a barometer, you would have said everyone was against mandates and was an anti-vaxxer because probably maybe not quite half, but 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 almost half of the crowd. Uh, were supporting the new blue and the concert and the uh, the Ontario party and they were loud and uh, and they were they were aggressive in their comments um, and uh, and their 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 banner waving etc so the based on the crowd the barometer would have been those parties would have uh, destroyed the conservative vote um, uh, taken a huge amount of, uh, of votes away from the conservative vote and, and done extremely well in the election and yet in the election campaign, they didn't. And so it's a very strong minority, a very vocal minority, but it's a small minority. Uh, I'll give you another uh, data point if I could. I, I, I ended up having a dinner with uh, a former um, uh, senior uh, employee of your uh, uh, former leader uh, from two times ago, um, who, uh, who sat down with me and said that uh, he's now, she's now working with uh, Pierre Polyev. And she said, it's like, it's like a new party. It's like, uh, you know, it's incredible the number of people that are coming out to rallies and they're all brand new, but a lot of them are anti-vaxxers and, um, and uh, are, we're part of the PCP. So it's almost as if this has been a, a hostile takeover of the PCP and they've joined the Conservative Party. So tell me, is this... The PCP? Are you referring to the PPC and Max Bernier's party? Yes, exactly. Sorry, I apologize. PCP is a drug. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, well, <laughs> okay. maybe that's a Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> maybe. So is this good for the Conservative Party to have such a vocal minority um, be so attracted to Pierre that they're going to be probably a very sizable portion of the memberships, but may not represent the either the Conservative electorate, let alone the full electorate? Well, I think you kind of answered your question in your preface that um, if they were that representative on the ballot and turnout, they would have had a different uh, outcome in the, uh, the election. So perhaps these are people that really like to go to rallies and really like to get turned up and and talk to each other and agree with each other vehemently. Um, but it doesn't turn out at, at election day because um, they are small and minority and they're dispersed and they're not efficient for our first past the post system. So I, I'm not I'm not worried about that per se. And I actually think that this is um, it, as much as um, Pierre probably wouldn't like me to say this, it, I think it's a it's it's an issue that will um, uh, it, it, it's an issue that will motivate less and less as time goes on. Um, as we get further and further uh, away from lockdown measures and closer and closer to a normal a normalized um, life where pandemics aren't the first thing that we think about every day. Um, there's not numbers of, uh, you know, cases and death counts and that happening, which is already, you know, uh, not have not leading the news anymore. So um, I think that this is this is like a this is a one time issue that was unique to the circumstances of the world. Um, and as that issue becomes less and less important, then these these um, groups will have less and less to agree upon and and organize and and actually be activists for. They'll they'll slide back into their ethers of being you know um, I don't know but you know whatever on their anti government and their in their uh, farms out in the country or or what have you. But they'll he still fly the flag on their truck. But he doesn't. I mean, he doesn't yeah. need that policy to last forever. It only needs to to last till September the tenth or whatever it is, and get them to come out and vote. And uh, and if uh, you're right based on the rally that you went to, and I'm right based on uh, on the rallies that uh, my friend uh, had gone to and seen, a lot of these new members are potentially people that were you know part of and supporters of the trucker convoy and and were motivated by the anti uh, mask mandates and. Uh, can I just say something though? We talk about the trucker convoy so pejoratively and negatively. And I think like that offends me. I didn't go out and support the trucker convoy. I didn't drive my car to the highway and flag and wave a flag and wave at them as they drove by. And I wasn't supportive of them uh, occupying downtown Ottawa and some of those things. But I am supportive of them and they're right in their opinion to exercise those opinions and those beliefs. I mean, I you know, I, I'm not supportive of uh, protest environmental groups that shut down pipelines or bring in hatchets to pipelines uh, and threaten people's uh, life and safety uh, for their values. But I am uh, I, I can support people's right to protest peacefully and lawfully. And, and I, I really think that we're doing a disservice to our own dialogue to just write off these trucker convoys as small um, minority um, extremists that were anti-vaxxers. By the sheer numbers alone of how many people got vaccinated in Canada, many of those truckers were vaccinated, but they were there against mandates. So I think that we, if we really want to understand this phenomenon, we best not just fluff it off as some extreme group. Okay, and... and uh... You know, I have uh, been very vocal that, uh, you know, I think 15% uh, of the Canadian population actually supported uh, the trucker convoy based on Angus Reid po polls and, and polls like that. And people could argue that it might have been higher or lower. But, but you know, I think that the average of the polls was around 15%. That's four and a half million people. Four and a half million people should be listened to. And I think that uh, they, I agree with you, they had a right to protest. They had a right to assemble. And, and I think our governments, both federal and provincial, made a mistake in not listening to them. And, and I think our electoral system is such that that uh, voice wasn't heard in parliament. And if Maxime Bernier had been elected under a proportional representation system or whatever, they would have been listened to and, and that may have had a different result. That said, um, you know, I, I think that, and you know, I've been to a lot of protests probably like you have been. Uh, I go, I maybe take a sign, but I don't bring an 18 wheeler and I don't uh, stay around for 30 days and I don't, uh, uh, honk my horn at two o'clock in the morning. So I do think that the trucker convoy um, 
I think we're going to have a change to attitude and change in laws. Um, and, you know, Wellington Street in front of Ottawa, I, I understand, is still not open. Um, so I think that we're going to have a change in attitude and change in laws that, that uh, if you want to protest, you can protest, but you can't bring a truck, you can't bring an 18 wheeler. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to stay overnight. It's going to be very difficult to, to, to occupy. Um, and, uh, and, and police forces like in Toronto and Montreal and Quebec city that were able to, uh, uh disperse those crowds uh, reasonably quickly and not allow them to bring trucks, not allow them to park is going to be what happens. Um, but I also agree with you. I don't think that, uh, environmental groups on the left should be bringing hatchets, um, and, uh, and I think blocking bridges and blocking railways are, uh, uh, are both equally, uh, equally wrong. Um, so I, I, I agree with some of what you said in regards to, you know, if four and a half million people have a point of view, they should be listened to, but I don't think they should be able to take over a city. I'm not suggesting that. I wasn't in support of that. But what I'm saying is in terms of this conversation of where do they fit within the big blue tent, I think to just say that they have you know, one issue and it's very simplified as understanding that they're just against mandates and against government. I, I don't think that that really captures what was so um, uh, influential for so many people that were participating in this type of uh, democratic protests that probably had never participated in, in any such protest previously. Um, so I think that, you know, we would do well to perhaps listen to why people felt so disenfranchised and why they felt that their only recourse was to protest in the way that they, they did. Um, and I, and I think that that deserves some attention. And I think that as part of the conversation that, that, that leadership candidates should be having. And, and, you know, I, I, it, you know, everyone was kind of tiptoeing around while the occupation was happening, not wanting to be aligned with unlawful protesting, but also wanting to benefit from uh, saying that they are supportive of their uh, of the reasons that they're protesting. So it was a very delicate, you okay, know, so let's, let's take it. Politics that we're trying to do. Let's bring um, it back but, to the leadership uh, convention then, um, or leadership uh, contest. So uh, Jean Charest has said that Pierre Polyev should be disqualified from being a leader um, or a prime minister because he effectively uh, uh, sanctioned a unlawful uh, protest. Uh, and then Dr. Leslie Ann Lewis effectively said, uh, but you didn't support the protest enough. And so therefore you're not uh, credible because you didn't actually go out with them. You met with them far away from Parliament Hill. So which is right? Is it, is it, is it, is it Polyev's attitude that uh, sounds like it was very supportive? Uh, Dr. Leslie Ann Lewis that said you should have been more supportive or Jean Chay that says it was unlawful, you, you should be disqualified. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's not for me to decide what's, what's right on this. I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, the fact that Pierre is benefiting from the support from the, those people that participated in that protest tells you, I think that he was out there at the right time saying the right things to them. Um, and that they're motivated and they're out there supporting him. So, you know, I, I don't think the, the, the criticism that he wasn't out there soon enough, hard enough, and fast enough is it really holds water with those people and those protesters. And I think Jean Charest saying that Pierre should be disqualified. I, I think that that was, you know, I think that's a, you know, ivory tower mistake. Like that's only going to serve to motivate people to support him more. Um, and that's within your own party. So, you know, by saying Pierre should be disqualified and he's the front runner, I mean, you've just basically alienated, um, you know, a good 50, 50 to 60 percent of your party. Even people that don't agree with Pierre thinks that Pierre think agree that Pierre should at least be on the ballot. I mean, this this guy has worked for this party and worked in this role his whole entire life. And and say what you will about Pierre, and I've known I've known Pierre since. 2003 um and he's hardworking. he um really understands the grassroots um he understands the pulse of the party and he loves this country he you can tell from some of his uh, really clever and well done social media clips you know I, I like the one where he's talking about um Diefen Baker and Laurier 
And he has such a love of history of this country and patriotism. It's hard not to get excited when he when he talks about about Canada and its founding and our beliefs and where freedom reigns in that that historical context. Um, so I think for for Charest to go out there and say, look, he should be disqualified because he was out talking to the convoy. I, I think it's just another misread of, of Charest. And it, and it is that kind of different vision of, you know, Pierre being the populist of the people and Charest being of the progressive conservative, you know, I know uh, what's best for you um, um, leadership type and uh, of the party. And, and they are at odds, you know, um, uh, intellectually and, and, and by principle as well. Someone described it, it to me as uh, the competition between the Laurentian elite and the rural mm -hmm. Western um, uh, populism. Yeah, I mean, but that's been a constant tension within this party since its inception, <laughs> like, right? Um, you know, and, and, you know, ask Brian Mulroney about awarding contracts and, and, and helicopters and, and what that means for that, that those elements of the party. Um, you know, there's different cultural kind of uh, um, associations with the party and context for the party. So, you know, the Laurentian elites, I think, you know, it's the John Ibbotson's um, moniker that I think will, will stick forever. But there is that difference of, you know, a progressive conservative who is someone that's not afraid to be uh, much more involved in social policy and social engineering, uh, quote unquote, um, you know, providing incentives and disincentives for certain types of behavior that we deem good or bad according to certain uh, mores of the day versus, you know, um, the average Joe knows what's best to do for them and their family. Um, so yeah, there's a constant tension there and it's always been there and we're not the only party that has it. I mean, the NDP has it as well, right? You've got working class union members and then in private sector, and then you've got, you know, um, those, uh, that, um, are, you know, uh, university professors that profess to know what's best for everybody. And there's certain elements of that within all parties. I and mean, we're, we're all big tents, right? We don't all believe the same things. I mean, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. Um, so where do I fit on, on this spectrum, right? So um, I, I think that if you can agree on most of the things most of the time, um, then, then you're in the right party. We're chatting tonight with Sarah McIntyre. She is the founder of VUCA Sarah, a GR, uh, government relations, uh, government affairs, public affairs uh, consulting company. She's a long-term uh, conservative activist. She was director of communications for Christy Clark uh, when she was the premier of, uh, of British Columbia. She was in, uh, involved in communications uh, with Stephen Harper when he was the prime minister of Canada. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with uh, Sarah on this conservative uh, leadership campaign federally in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everybody, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm uh, having a really fun time uh, tonight talking to Sarah McIntyre, who is a long-term uh, conservative insider uh, working in communications for the former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, working for Christy Clark, uh, and uh, being very involved in, uh, in uh, the Canadian Alliance. So she showed us her membership card from 19, no, no, 2004, uh, and, uh, and also uh, very involved in, uh, in, in the merger of uh, the Canadian Alliance and the Progressive Conservative Party, and, and obviously Stephen Harper's successful uh, Prime Ministership. Um, Sarah, let's talk about some of the other uh, candidates, if we could, for uh, a couple of minutes, because you, I think, know them uh, well. Um, uh, some people think Patrick Brown could be a compromise uh, candidate. Uh, uh, he uh, seems to have been doing an incredible job, um, uh, particularly within the ethnic communities uh, and, and suburban, um, uh, suburban ridings uh, in recruiting new members. Uh, I got to tell you, last Friday, I was at a mosque and, uh, and I ran into his wife who was out there selling memberships uh, in, the, in the mosque and, uh, and wearing hijab. And I was really quite impressed with how many people knew her and knew him and were very supportive of, of him. Uh, and he seems to have uh, used that strategy to be successful in Ontario uh, uh, in the leadership uh, um, uh, campaign that he ran. Uh, and then, um, you know, we've got uh, Dr. Leslie Ann Lewis, who, uh, who what, came in third um, last time, I think it was, uh, and through her support um, one way uh, to Erno O'Toole, and was probably one of the reasons, one of the main reasons why, in the end, uh, Erno O'Toole won the leadership over, uh, over uh, 
uh, Peter McKay. Uh, and then we've got, uh, um, you got Roman Babber, who uh, got kicked out of the Progressive Conservative Caucus in, uh, in Queen's Park because of his uh, opposition to the, the Ford um, mandates at the time. And so one would think he would be able to really attract some of those people that are anti-vaxxers, anti-mass mandate people. What do, what do you think about some of the other candidates? Tell us what you think. Well, I mean, look, it, it was a pretty high threshold uh, in order to qualify. You had to raise quite a bit of money and you had to have quite a bit of support all over uh, the, the country, not just in one localized area. So the fact that all of these candidates did reach that threshold shows that they do have some appeal and they do have some organization and they've got some ability to, to raise some, some funds. I mean, um, you know, I talked to Roman uh, Babber, uh, I don't know, I guess it was about six months ago now, because he was kind of considering not sure what he should do in his political career, but he had this real uh, passion for, you know, that for Canada and, and you know, good governance and, and making sure, it, you know, he grew up in a communist regime and, and really saw uh, the effects of that on people's daily lives and, and choice and lifestyle. And so he was very uh, vocal against the mandates, as he said, under under Doug Ford and therefore was kicked out of the party. But he had a, a pretty big roster of people that were signing up on his website that were supportive of him. So he he basically had 45 to 60,000 um, uh, contact names right off the bat that helped him kind of get out the door. Um, and I do think that a lot of those people were people that were at the trucker uh, convoys or with, um, you know, supported the um, the end to mandates and, and lockdowns. So um, I, I think, you know, he would probably, his support base will probably go to Pierre, I would think. Um, Scott um, Atchison, I think, will probably go to Sheree or, or Patrick Brown. Now, so tell us if you could a little bit about Scott Atchison. I don't know him well. I don't know him well either. I do know that his uh, kingpin campaign manager, um, Jamie Ellerton, is um, is is uh, is very strategic, smart. Worked with Jamie in the past, um, and so the fact that he's been able to attract someone like that to run his campaign shows that uh, you know he's got some appeal to old time uh, conservatives that uh, want to take part in a in perhaps a, a new modern direction. I you know he'll end up. You know, some of the reasons why people run isn't necessarily always to win. Um, it's to a, either be the kingmaker, you know, especially in a preferential ballot, but also to get some good rec name recognition for perhaps a, a better uh, shadow cabinet post or a cabinet post should the party under the new leader win and win a, a general election, or perhaps they want to run in another uh, four or five years for leader of the party. So it's not always about, you know, make everyone running because they think that they're going to win. Um, but uh, I, I don't know too much about, about Scott, uh, to, to be honest. Um, you know, the other candidates, Dr. Lewis, the only female that's running. I'm, you know, I think the party has a bit of a problem in terms of the kind of candidates they attract. Um, but, uh, you know, she's gotten more name recognition and more, uh, appeal and base uh, since the last leadership um, contest, and she represents a part of the party that I don't think any of the other con uh, uh, candidates are really speaking to. Um, so when let's it talk comes about to that. Brown, can can we that? talk about her? I apologize for interrupting, but uh, sure. you know, social conservative, uh, anti-abortionist, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, very socially conservative attitudes. Got a lot of church uh, members uh, to support her. Um, how do you think she'll do? I think she'll do better than she did last time, but I, I mean, she's, I don't think that she's going to be in the top three. Um, but uh, I mean, I think that that social conservative vote and part of the, the tent cult is, is always going to be there. I think it's become less and less of a um, factor uh, in, in, you know, leadership for leadership contenders. Um, you know, basically we haven't had a leader that's had any, you know, been able to say that they would do anything on a social conservative uh, legislatively and in a number of years. So, uh, you know, I, I think she, she attracts that can, that type of uh, supporter. She speaks to them. And, but I, I don't think it's going to be something that is going to be able to, you know, will be the dominant kind of uh, concern for, for most members. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, she's, it's good that her voice is out there and she's represented and, 
Um, but again, I don't, I don't know her personally either, but, uh, abortion I, is I mean, obviously a huge issue in the United States and in the Republican party. Is it still an issue within the conservative party? I don't think so. I, I mean, I think it's an issue for people, uh, you know, like in Canada, there's no law on, on the books, right? So there's issues in Canada with respect to sex selection abortions, which are quite prevalent and that is problematic and we should have some policy and legislation around that. Um, you know, you could have later term abortions, which is a problem. A lot of doctors won't perform them, but, you know, it's not against the law. So, um, and I think that it's, it's not a vote determiner. It's, it's, it's more of a, a vote motivator. Um, and I think people, you know, we, we think that it's just these, you know, extreme uh, religious church groups that, that feel this way, but there, there are a lot of um, immigrants that come to this country that have a lot of traditional values that don't believe in um, abortion and, 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 uh, or same sex selection abortions and those types of things. So it is, it is an issue, but I don't think it's a, it's one that is anywhere near as predominant or contentious as the U S absolutely not. And, and that you, you see that there's a reason why our politicians don't really talk about it because it's not, it's not an issue that's running for Canadians. I interrupted you when you wanted to talk about Patrick Brown. Why don't we go there? Yeah, I mean, I've known Patrick for a while. Um, uh, he, as you know, as you said, he's done really great work at making sure um, uh, lots of different communities are engaged in the political process. And um, you know, he's uh, he's been renowned for having that type of outreach. Um, I think he's got some credibility issues with the federal conservatives base, which is different than than the provincial, certainly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's going to that's going to drag him down and that's going to dog him and the other candidates are going to use that. Uh, you know, he he was a leader that came out and basically supported carbon taxes without consulting the party and its membership. And that, you know, was the same thing. <laughs> How many times do we have to go to this movie and see like, you know, if you don't preview it with your membership and you put it out in your platform, it's going to be a problem. So he's got that that's dogging him. And um, so, and, and I don't know how much of his appeal is beyond Ontario. Uh, and as, as we mentioned earlier at the top of the, the discussion, you know, the, the point system and how it's weighted, you really do have to have some um, national organization and name recognition and appeal and support in order to be um, a top contender. So what's your bet right now? What's the uh, what's the lineup and priority going to be? Don't tell me who's going to win, but you know what what order do you think they're going to be on the first ballot? Um, well, I think I actually think it's going to be a first ballot win. Really? And I think the party needs that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's Polya Peter Polya that, yeah. that you say is going to win on the first ballot. Yeah. Really, that's yeah. fascinating. Um, so I, you know, I've been involved in politics uh, a while. Um, Stephen Del Duca won on the first ballot. Uh, a lot of people said that was good for the party um, uh, in the Ontario uh, Liberal leadership campaign two years ago, um, and he resigned uh, this past week. Um, and he appealed. To, he had great, the best organization. He appealed to uh, uh, you know a lot of people, but uh, clearly it, it wasn't. <laughs> I, but I know I, I not to be glib, but the the two parties are in very different positions than uh, in in you know the Liberal Party of Ontario was completely decimated. It wasn't even official party status when I went through a leadership review. You know the Conservative Party federally is basically pulling neck and neck with the the federal Liberals. So there is in a very we're in very different um, uh, realms and and um, than than what the Liberal Party of Ontario was when Del Duca was was uh, elected. And it, you know. I, I, I've met him a couple times. I don't know him, but it, the, the problem was is the party was decimated based on, you know, not just with Kathleen Wynne, but her performance. But, uh, you know, it uh, he was there at the table for all of that. And if you did, you saw the polling early when he became leader, the more people saw of him, the less they liked him. And enough, I don't I don't know if that's just a, a telegenic thing about how people present on TV. Um, but that is an important factor in, in, in leaderships and political leadership. You have to be able to get your message out beyond your uh, curb your appeal, right? So, well, that's um, my concern. If I was a conservative, that would be my concern with uh, Pierre Polyev, that he'll, 
He'll appeal to the base. He'll appeal to these new people that have joined the conservative party and he could win on the first ballot, but he's less electable nationally than Jean Chaudet is. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I think that it actually would be a mistake uh, to uh, elect him on the first ballot. And I, and I guess I'm trying to, to draw my, uh, my historical um, wisdom's not the right word, but uh, experiences uh, from, you know, Dalton McGinty, I think was fourth on the first ballot and went on to, you know, almost a 15 year, uh, uh, history, uh, uh, a successful uh, government. Um, um, I can't remember. Uh, did Stephen Harper win on the first ballot? I guess he did. Yeah. Um, you know, on the first ballot in 2006, I think it was, it was, uh, um, or 2008, it was Michael Ignatieff and, uh, and, and that would not have been successful. Anyway, it's interesting. So you think he's going to win on the first ballot. So who's going to come in second, Shade? Probably. Yeah. And then yeah, I think, you know, I think you, we may see, we may see, I don't know if we'll see all six candidates go through to September 10th. We may have some people pull out early and throw their uh, organization and support behind others. Somebody else. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, I, Pierre's always been underestimated. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think he he likes that. And there was somebody else that was always underestimated was was Stephen Harper. Um, remember when he became leader and uh, people made fun of his uh, lack of international travel and how he was going to be able to engage with other uh, foreign dignitaries. And I think if you look back on Stephen Harper's tenure as prime minister, one of his strengths that will be written about in the history books is his leadership on all things international, um, especially during the financial crisis. So look, I, I think um, it's it's going to come down to it. You know, I think it'd be good for the party if we've got a, a clear uh, winner that has national support. And just because, you know, parties, leadership contests are parties within, you know, their fights within the family. Um, and it, I think what Pierre has proven is his ability to grow as a communicator to grow as in terms of he's he's always had a good amount of support from from caucus a good amount of support from grassroots he's had good support from his his staff and he's been in ottawa and he knows how it works so um you know i don't think that you know, the talking point you'll see that uh, it will be predominant for him in the next four months will be the same when it comes to general election time, uh, you know, it's a moment in time. And I think he recognizes, uh, and I think all conservatives recognize that what it takes to win the leadership is not the same recipe that what it will take to win the general election. Irene, I mean, the governor of the Bank of Canada- politics for long enough. Sorry. You know, proposing to fire the governor of the Bank of Canada and, uh, and saying that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation, you know, are those two policies smart policies? Well, I'm not. I'm not here to comment and decide whose party, whose uh, leadership platform is the best. I mean, I do think that people feel that there should be some accountability for um, the rate of inflation, it, it, and, and I recognize that we all know it's. It, there's some global headwinds that are pushing that. You know, Ukraine supply chain issues, et cetera. But you know, I also am one that watch uh, the Bank of Canada's uh, governors' uh, news conferences every every month as well. And I, I do remember when you know Tiff was kind of um, saying that inflationary pressures were 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 transitory, and that wasn't that long ago. And, yeah. and since then, we've gone up to you know 20, 30 year highs. So um, if you're the Bank of Canada governor, and that's what you're saying about inflation six months ago. Uh, you know, I think that there should be a tough conversation about accountability on that. And, you know, I, I think what Pierre's point is, is that, you know, during the, the pandemic, uh, the fiscal stimulus that was uh, driving um, the federal government, you know, there, the, the Bank of Canada governor wasn't signaling, okay, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, we, we need to we need to get our inflationary goals in, uh, in check and actually, um, you know, exercise some austerity on a monetary policy standpoint but but he didn't do that so um that being said you know tiff was tiff was the deputy minister during uh jim flaherty's time at finance so he has a long relationship with a lot of finance um minded people in the conservative party so although i i will say i have been a bit disappointed by his performance as governor and and, and it is 
up to the prime minister to determine who, who the Bank of Canada governor is. Chatting with Sarah McIntyre, uh, the founder of VUCA Sarah, uh, GR, Government Relations, uh, Public Affairs, Government Affairs uh, Consulting Company, a long-term Conservative Party member and activist, Director of Communications for Christy Clark and Stephen Harper. We're going to take a break, a uh, final break, and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. First time I'm back in uh, three weeks, and so it's a real pleasure to uh, talk about federal politics uh, tonight with Sarah McIntyre, uh, founder of VUCA Sarah, a government relations uh, consulting company. Sarah, you know, my impression of Doug Ford, uh, the, the newly once again reelected uh, uh, Premier of Ontario last week, uh, is that he was sort of right wing Pierre Polyev like in the first year of his uh, of his government and did not do well. Uh, Trudeau ran against him successfully. And then he sort of transitioned into a progressive conservative, more like Jean Charest, um, big tent in the last couple of years um, and uh, and was more successful and, and, and got reelection because of that. And the last budget that he announced, you, you couldn't call a fiscally conservative budget. It was far more, uh, almost a liberal budget. Uh, and you know most of the, the, the pundits were saying there was very little space between the liberals and the progressive conservatives in the last election. What's the lesson of Doug Ford for the Conservative Party federally? Well, I, I think, you know, the, the lesson is that um, don't don't count any voter base out. <laughs> and and and, you know, there's always new uh, voter coalitions that you can um, form. So, so basically, you know, Doug uh, has the private sector unions are behind him, but uh, you know, even some polling has suggested suggested that public sector unions were behind him. A very different conservative coalition than the Mike Harris coalition, um, you know, of of years gone by. And so, I think what what the lesson for federal conservatives are is, if you if it. You don't have to see the world in, uh, you know, these are potential, these are our base and these aren't our, this isn't our base. Don't count anyone out of your base. You, you can reorganize and reconstitute your coalition and it can be a winning one. Um, and, you know, you don't necessarily have to get die hard. It doesn't always just have to be die hard conservatives. What you want are the undecideds and you want the middle. And so that's where you win elections. Um, and so, you know, I think for federal leaders uh, in this, this uh, leadership contest, uh, you, you need to be not just talking to the current coalition as it exists now, um, but really think about strategically what, how else you, who else you could add to that coalition in order to be a winner. I understand that, uh... You've got a connection with uh, the Queen's Jubilee. Tell me what that is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very, very removed connection. I was watching, of course, as many people are, the Platinum Jubilee for, for the Queen. And it reminded me of how long it's been since I've been active in politics, because one of the one of the um, events that I, I did for the Prime Minister when during my time there was the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. So. Um, it's been that long. So I, uh, I did, I was attended and helped with the communications and media relations for all of the Queen's events for the Diamond Jubilee, which Canadians will probably remember. She spent a good, uh, I think, uh, seven days in, in Canada and all across the country and did an incredible amount of events. Like I didn't even do all of her events because I was exhausted by it and I wasn't doing the events. I was just managing the media and I did get to meet her, um, as a at the end of at the very very end of her diamond jubilee at the lobby in the fairmont uh, in in toronto it was presented to her and and prince philip by uh, the canadian undersecretary to the queen kevin mcleod so yeah it's uh, pretty special to watch 70 years on the throne but it, it was a, a stark reminder of how long it's been since i've been active in politics <laughs> and this show is airing monday night and I understand that it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, geez. Yeah, great. Thanks. <laughs> yes. As I'm talking about how long it's been since I worked in Ottawa now, let's uh, remind myself of how, how old and another trip around the sun it's been. 
Thank you. Well, you're looking great and you're sounding great. It's a pleasure to uh, to chat with you and maybe a little bit uh, arguing uh, some of the points um, and, and happy birthday. All the best. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Well, that's our show for tonight. Thanks everyone for uh, joining. I'm uh, back on every Monday through Friday at six o'clock on Saga 960 AM. All my podcasts and videocasts are available on uh, my website, briancrombie.com. My videos are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, and LinkedIn. And the podcasts are on Apple, Audible, and Speakeasy Podcasts. Thanks for all of you to, uh, to, to share the last hour with me. And Sarah, good night, everybody. <laughs>